I was so full of sorrow and just sad and homeless and uh, sleeping outside in the rain. And I ended up behind this church and they let me in there to play their piano. I eventually obtained a key to this old chapel and they didn't know it, but I was living in there for several years of my life. I couldn't turn on the lights at night. So I had to walk around this giant chapel in the dark, but they had a uh, Yamaha piano in there, really good one. And I would just play and play and play that piano. That's essentially how I taught myself to play the piano is in a, an old chapel that I lived in that kept me off the streets. You're listening to The Gould Standard, Episode 20, Vreden von Streichenbach, A Musical Journey of Redemption. This is The Gould Standard, and now, as a public service, we bring you a moment to soothe the spirit and console the heart.
Hello, friends. I'm Brian Levine, and welcome to The Gould Standard, a podcast brought to you by the Glenn Gould Foundation, with some of the most remarkable people from all across the world of the arts. Now, while you're with us, please do take a moment to press like, share, and subscribe. And if you happen to be listening on Apple Podcasts, please kindly leave us your reviews, pose your questions, and be part of our community of friends and supporters. And to get more inspiring words, images, and sounds, you can pay us a visit on our website, glengould.ca. While you're there, you may come across our donate button, and we would be most grateful for your generous support, which will help us to continue our work at the Glenn Gould Foundation. Now today, as I say, we wanted to bring you something very special. I'm sure you won't be disappointed. At the start of the COVID pandemic, we introduced a feature on our website, a blog called the Glenn Gould Guide to Social Distancing. Knowing that people were experiencing an unprecedented level of isolation, solitude, and time by themselves and with their own thoughts, we wanted to celebrate the creative potential of solitude in Glenn Gould's spirit. And along the way, we received an unexpected contribution to the blog. It was a composition, an original piece called Gould's Music Box from a composer that we were unfamiliar with, an artist who goes by the pen name Vreden von Streichenbach, quite a, a euphonious appellation, if I do say so. Along with the piece was this description of Mr. Streichenbach. He is a self-taught classical pianist and composer who resides in the United States. He was first introduced to classical music as a teenager living on the streets, and he learned by studying the works of Bach, Beethoven, Chopin, Liszt, and Rachmaninoff. In performance, he has been much influenced by Glenn Gould, Ivo Pogorelic, and Mikhail Pletnyev, and he has composed numerous nocturnes, preludes, etudes, and other pieces for piano, as well as longer works, including his recent elegy for the victims of COVID-19, Music at the End of the World. Well, with that description, we knew that there was a remarkable story and probably a remarkable person. So I reached out to Vreden and got to know him and know a bit bit more about the journey that he's gone on, both in his life and through his music. And I think you're going to find it both moving and inspiring. It's such a great pleasure and a privilege to introduce the life and music of Vreden von Streichenbach to you today. Without further ado, welcome, Vreden von Streichenbach. Uh, thank you. It's um, good to be here with you. Good to finally uh, see you in person, since we've had many conversations on the phone. It's really been wonderful getting to know you. And, you know, since you've been so open about the challenges that you had early in life, I'd like to kind of trace our our friends through that experience. And uh, And I want to thank you for for sharing it with us, because I know that your road hasn't been an easy one uh, much of the way. Please just tell us a little bit about yourself and, you know, the circumstances in which you you grew up. Well, like I think many people in Canada and America, I came from a broken home and that has ramifications uh, to a person's psychology and their state of well-being. I, uh, I was abused as a child, so I had suffered quite a bit of trauma. And when a person goes through these kind of things, it leaves quite a profound impact on a person's life. And I was impacted by that. You know, I didn't go to, uh, Juilliard or, I uh, dropped out of school, um, in the eighth grade and, uh, was on and off the streets from the time I was about 14, but it's really hard to 
engage in my memory the exact dates. I think trauma has that impact on people that it kind of distorts uh, memory and time. Well, obviously that was an incredibly difficult way to start out in life. And, and I understand that your family is, or your background is uh, partially indigenous, is, is that, or Native American, as you would say, south of the border. Did that have some impact in terms of your, your background and the circumstances in which many Native Americans live today? Most certainly it did. One of the things I think that we've discovered about trauma is that it gets passed down from generation to generation. So if, for example, a person comes from a family where their parents are survivors of the Holocaust, there is trauma that gets passed down to the children. And in my case, being Native American, my grandfather was full-blooded, even though I look like I'm completely Caucasian, but uh, I am a quarter Native American. And that's the side of my culture that my heritage that I identify with the most. So when a ethnic group has been through a difficult uh, social process, it most certainly leaves a scar on the way that the generations relate one to another. And, uh, my grandfather didn't see a light bulb until he was 21, he told me. And he was really not equipped to teach his own children about the way the modern world works. And because of this, his children had a very hard time. And my father was in and out of jail and prison. He had a very severe addiction problem. This, I believe, all stems from what a ethnic group or a culture goes through as it passes through society and the adversity that it's faced with as it goes through its cultural process. So my father, having the problems that he did from his own childhood, was not able to function in society. It was very difficult for him. And because of this, he turned to alcohol, he turned to drugs as a coping mechanism. And at some point in my life, I got caught up in this, in between his addiction, my own life. Um, yeah, I think the Native American peoples in general, I think is very similar to the Jewish culture because the history of Native Americans is that they have gone through a process of genocide that has continued on for generations and is in many ways still continuing on right now. And Native American children do face a great deal of adversity, and it's very hard for them to adjust to the conditions of modern society. And even though I'm only a quarter Native American, I still come from that heritage. And so the social ramifications that basically my people suffered through they got passed on to me in one form or another. Right. I understand that at a certain point in your childhood or youth, you um, crossed the border and spent time in Canada. And I don't know whether you've been following the reports, but as you may know, part of the history of cultural and also to a, a substantial degree physical genocide in Canada consisted of the residential school system. The uh, taking of children from their parents under penalty of imprisonment if the children, if the parents resisted, and placing them in schools with unbelievably harsh and abusive conditions, often sexual abuse, physical abuse, malnutrition, forbidding them to speak their native languages, to see their parents. And within the last week or 10 days, uh, at one of the largest of these schools in Kamloops, British Columbia, it has been discovered that uh, in unmarked burial grounds, there are the remains of 215 children who died over the course of the history of, of that school. So we certainly on this side of the border have, we're not an exception. We are very much equally culpable in this, this obscenity, in this horrific series of crimes based on the misguided notion that 
somehow European settler culture was so innately superior that indigenous culture had to be wiped out. But I, I understand that you, you actually ended up spending some time in British Columbia. Is that not correct? Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, when I was about 14 or 15, I went to live with my father. Now, I hadn't seen him my whole life. So at first it was very good. Things went very well because he was um, sober. I think he had just gotten out of jail and uh, we moved into our own apartment. And then shortly after that, his, my grandmother passed away. So he didn't know how to cope with loss. And I mean, many of us don't, it's a difficult thing. So he returned to uh, alcohol and drugs and things changed very quickly from that point on. I uh, was basically caught up in the middle of his addiction um, as a teenager. And it was difficult to see mainly because I had such a great love for my father. I hadn't seen him for most of my life. So to, to see him do well, to go from a state of doing well, to go from a state of collapse was very hard to deal with. I came home one day and then he, he was started drinking, but with people that have severe substance use disorder, what happens is that's usually just the beginning. And I have to assume that as a 14 or 15 year old, this was an extremely unhealthy environment. I mean, not to blame your father, but those were the conditions. And, you know, and oh, you, yeah. you weren't in school at this point. Uh, no, because I dropped out. I lived with him. I, I don't remember the exact length of time. Uh, we had no food because he would spend all of the money to purchase alcohol and drugs. And the reason he did this is because he felt so incredibly bad about himself. And I think taking up the substances allowed him to distance himself from these feelings of self-hatred or shame or whatever he had. So it was a way of coping, a way of surviving. So food became actually a very serious issue for me when I was in Canada. So I would get up in the morning and then go beg on the street. I would try to get one loony, which is a dollar. And then I would try to get a quarter, a dollar 25. Um, because I could buy a loaf of French bread and then I could buy a package of top ramen. So that was my routine pretty much every day. That was tolerable. I think the most difficult thing was seeing him, you know, destroy himself and not be able to see his own actions or his own behaviors in the process. I think that was probably the most difficult thing. And I'm imagining that millions of children across the world, everywhere, deal with this on a regular basis. It's part of their story. I guess maybe it's good to know that, um, for them to know that they're not alone in this process, that other people have gone through this kind of thing. There are people that care that other people go through this kind yes. of thing. It, it's absolutely, it's true. It's horrifying. Now, just was it, was your father, were you and your father living on reservation or in one of the, the larger cities like Victoria or Vancouver? We lived in Vancouver. I think it was a subsidized uh, housing that we lived in. We had uh, one couch in there and one old television. I think I would just spend a lot of time in there by myself. My dad would, I would see him get up in the morning. He would go beg for money on the street and he would get just enough to purchase two bottles of Chinese cooking wine because it was cheaper. And he'd be very sick in the morning. And I see him down those two bottles every morning. And I remember the lady at the store telling him, you can't drink this. It's not healthy for you, but it would remove his, uh, he would get shakes from drinking. So it would remove his shakes. Yeah. I remember many times seeing the sun come up and, uh, him drinking those those bottles early right. in the morning. I mean, a couple of things come to me. First of all, how lonely this must have been, how bound to your father, because what would he do without you? You must have felt. On the street, did you have friends? Were there other uh, kids that you could hang out with, that you could 
share your story with, to find some some comradeship with? I had uh, one friend in Canada. I tried to uh, hang out with him one time and then bring him back to the apartment we had. And when I opened the door, the apartment was filled with blood. I mean, it's very serious. Uh, there was blood all over the floor. It was sprayed on the walls. The whole bathroom floor was covered in droplets of blood. Uh, nobody was there. And uh, my friend became very afraid. That was the last time I talked to him because he left immediately. So I was left in there in the apartment, not knowing what happened. But apparently my father had gotten into a fight with the person that he had met on the street. That person had assaulted him, had broke a uh, coffee cup over his head, split his head, and there was blood everywhere. So I had a friend there, but that event altered the course of our friendship. Fortunately, my dad survived that situation. Yeah, you're right, though. It, it, it was uh, an incredibly lonely existence when I was there. It's something I should say about homelessness. Usually when a person faces homelessness, they face it not just one time, but they face it over and over again repeatedly. It's usually a process or a cycle that an individual is caught up in. And so, you know, homelessness is something that I have faced repeatedly uh, throughout my life, not just when I was in Canada, when I was also in the United States.
I would invite our listeners, because many of you will not have heard a, a life story like this before, to think about what you feel and what passes through your thoughts and through your heart when you pass someone on the street, you know, asking for change. You know, do you think that there's something wrong or lesser about that person? Or do you recognize? And I mean, this is an invitation to all of us to understand the essential oneness that we have, the common humanity that we have, and to understand that what we're seeing is a brother or a sister in need and in pain. This is an issue that I think is one of the great challenges of our time. You know, the fashionable word for this is othering. You know, really, it's understanding that each human being is equally human, regardless of their circumstances, and, and that there is a story that needs to be understood and told. So, you know, it's really at the peril to our own selves that we, that we pass by in a, uh, in a dismissive or spiteful way. But you've experienced all of that. And, and as you, you, I'm sure you know, in Canada, we've had many revela revelations about the plight of Indigenous women and the, that there is generation after generation of missing and murdered Indigenous women, including one case of a, a mass killing in which women who were, you know, in some cases working on the streets because they had no other alternative, were taken to a pig farm where they were killed and their bodies were, were dealt with. So this is a very multidimensional set of problems. And part of the, the issue, I think, is that we haven't really cried out for justice and compassion. Um, but you've, you've undoubtedly experienced that. You know, asking people for change, I'm sure you received more than your fair share of rough and dismissive treatment, I would think. I remember uh, the best story of uh, begging for food money. This lady came up to me and she said... Uh, she had a big container of vegetables. It was like Chinese vegetable stir fry. And she said, um, I ordered this, but I'm not going to eat it. Will you eat it? I was so happy. I said, of course I would. And uh, I remember going back to the apartment that we had and eating that and feeling just a boost of energy because my body was in such need because I'd been living on just bread and top ramen for so long. So, um that was a, you know, authentic act of kindness from that lady. I still remember it. You know, I'll never forget it. You know, it, it brought light to my day and uh, instilled a good memory of, of kindness from, from people. And those gestures, they may seem small to those of us who are privileged and, and have the good fortune not to have to live on the street, but simply that human contact and recognition of another person when their humanity is so often dismissed can mean it can mean a world um i wanted to ask and and if this is uncomfortable for you to to answer you know let me know but because your your father was having these ongoing substance problems was there violence living with him well yes i mean not only the event that with the apartment where he was assaulted and the apartment's full of blood. But before I had left, he had gotten into a fight with uh, my uncle who had come to stay with us and they had gotten drunk together and my uncle had got on top of him and basically he had punched him in the face uh, repeatedly. My father crawled on the ground for over an hour and a half because he was got hurt so bad from that. Then when he got up, he was really mad. So he tried to jump out of the third story window because my uncle was down below taunting him. And uh, he grabbed a knife and tried to jump out of the third story window. So I rushed over there, wrapped my arms around him and put my foot against the wall and tried to, you know, pull him back in because he was very drunk. I managed to pull him back in. The reason I, I choke up a bit when I tell the story is because uh, I was resentful and bitter toward my father for drinking so much and we didn't have a good relationship and he tried to do what he could. But that moment when I grabbed him and tried to pull him back, I think his body relaxed because I gave him a hug and I, I felt good hugging him. And it, it was the last time I would in fact hug my father. 
So I, I got him away from the window and then he ran downstairs and he's chasing my uncle around this parking lot at three in the morning. Please come. They put him in handcuffs and they place him under this tree. And then he says to me, uh, I love you, son. And those were the last words I would hear from him. About a month later, when I was back in the United States, I had received a phone call that, um, I can't believe how emotional it is to tell this after all these years. I had received a phone call. Take your time, please. Just give me a second for it. Sure. I had received a phone call that he had uh, died from a heroin overdose, and I was uh, I was quite crushed from that. What happened to me when I heard that is that I became almost catatonic from it. Uh, mm. I didn't expect it. I was only fifteen, and uh, I uh, just did not talk, and I would I would just walk around the streets all the time. And I, I couldn't find anything that kind of made contact with how I felt until one event that altered the trajectory of my life. And that was, that, that was when I heard the Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven, specifically the first movement. Because when I heard that, it felt like it was expressing exactly how I felt inside. I think there's a famous quote attributed to Tchaikovsky. He said, uh, where words end, music begins. And I felt like that sonata or that movement, basically, it gave me some kind of relief and also um, made me feel like I wasn't alone within the course of my pain. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what classical music has always meant to me. It's always meant that there's other people in the world who are sharing their suffering and their emotional experience. And it's a social connection. And in many ways, I think therapeutic in that sense. Now, was this just a, a chance encounter? I mean, were you in a a public space or were you visiting someone and the music was on in the background? Uh, how did that, that, that come about? Well, actually, I think I was watching a film. The film was, uh, it's the most excellent film. I'm sure you know it. It's, um, it's called Immortal Beloved. Oh, sure. Absolutely. About Beethoven. And it's, of course, the scene where he goes in and, uh, you know, plays the, uh, the piano, the Moonlight Sonata. It was at that moment, I think, that I felt a very deep connection to classical music. Well, that's, that is a, one of those um, lightning bolt from out of the sky moments. Once you had had that experience, what was your next step? I mean, how did you, how did you respond after that? My memory is very cloudy on everything that occurred between that time and the next event that's kind of clear in my mind is, um, I started to play the piano wherever I could find one. And eventually what happened is, uh, I ended up in a church and I ended up in, in this church because, uh, I had been drinking. I was about 18 years old or something. And, uh, I started drinking because I wanted to just kill myself at some point. And, um, I was, so full of sorrow and just sad and homeless and, uh, sleeping outside in the rain. And I ended up behind this church and, uh, they let me in there to play their piano. I eventually obtained a key to this old chapel and they didn't know it, but I was living in there for several years of my life. I couldn't turn on the lights at night. So I had to walk around this giant chapel in the dark. But they had a uh, Yamaha piano in there, really good one. 
and I would just play and play and play that piano. And uh, that's essentially how I taught myself to play the piano is in a, an old chapel that I lived in uh, that kept me off the streets. Well, they don't call it sanctuary for nothing, I guess. <laughs> um, but th that's really fascinating because you hadn't played a musical instrument before. You, you hadn't received any, any training. You, you essentially taught yourself completely. Yeah. I just love listening to classical music. Back then they had Walkman, a Walkman. I'm sure you remember that. Uh, Very well, The younger yes. people of today don't even know what that is, but uh, you put a cassette tape in there, plug in headphones, and you could listen to music. So I would always have a Walkman on me, and I would always be listening to Beethoven, Mahler, Chopin, Tchaikovsky, Liszt, Rachmaninoff. And even though I was alone in the world and alone on the streets much of the time, having that music with me, it gave me such a sense of comfort and repose and peace. You know, so I really learned by listening to classical music and then by just trying to express myself as I approach the instrument. I have to say, you know, I, I find your music very striking and frequently very moving. But at what point did you start to think, I can be a composer? I can actually create music that other people can listen to, that I can leave for them and to try to share my inner life and uh, hopefully, you know, do for them what, what some of these other composers have done for me. You know, I'm not sure that I uh, had a conscious thought like I could be a composer. It was more a matter of coping. When I was like 16 or 17, I stayed in this isolated room and I was writing, writing, writing all this poetry. And I produced this small book that I had titled No Outlet for the Pain because that's how I had felt. And, and music to me, it was... It was an outlet. So it wasn't a matter of me thinking I could be a composer. Music, in my case, has always been a matter of survival, of coping with the burdens and the sorrow of existence. It's, it's never changed that course. It's always been that for me. And I suspect it will always be that for me until the day I die.
even though you didn't originally conceive of yourself as a composer in that sense, that it was simply something that you felt an inner drive to do as a way of dealing with what was going on inside you, you have produced a body of works and now a rather significant body of works. It's um, a lot of your music is on a YouTube channel that you've set up and it's, uh, I think at last count it was 42 uh, different selections uh, posted there. I'm not sure how many there are. I'm, I'm constantly uh, deleting them and putting new ones up there. I have a very strict schedule that I try to abide by, which is uh, eight days of break. And then I begin my composition process, which normally lasts. It can go anywhere from two to 10 days. These days are very intense. I don't see my act of composing music as a static once and for all process. It's, it's just, it's constantly um, progressing. It's constantly changing. I'm always learning more always trying to push myself beyond the state that I was in before. And I haven't arrived at, I don't feel that I've reached a ceiling in my development at all. I had a 10 year gap in my, my playing, which was very significant. That really set me back. It was almost from square one that I had to begin again. Really? How did that happen? Uh, what were, were you experiencing that led to that? Well, because of my history and my background, mental health has always been somewhat of a struggle for me. On two separate occasions in my life, I have been involuntarily committed. I'm constantly battling with my mental health. And the thing I think that people need to understand about mental health issues is that the people who suffer them, it is not something that the individual can control as an act of will. It doesn't work that way. Our brains have a wiring process, and if the wiring process becomes maladaptive, then we can be left with scars, we can be left with destructive emotional patterns that cause us to deal with adversity and just make life harder than it needs to be. And uh, I just had a lot of struggle in that 10-year period. I can't really explain uh, fully Part of it was just my living situation. I was not in a position where I could actually pursue my music. And I think that's probably one of the most relevant things for artists all across the world. The amount of talent that is thwarted because people do not have the resources they need to bring their talent to fruition. This has to be one of the great tragedies of the human species because it results in a loss to the overall human race. People are not able to develop their capacity and by not being able to do that, other people miss out. And so, which brings me to the, you know, this notion of poverty and the way that it has an impact on art. And in my case, it's really poverty that I would think prevented my continuation in my studies. But you you did pass through that period, and, and I'd like to sort of discuss what you found on the other side and how you were able to return to music. And I also would like to sort of expand the conversation because I can't help noticing that you're surrounded by books. <laughs> so I have to assume that reading and literature have also played an important part in your life and in your engagement in the world and finding strategies for reconciling to the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, when I lived in that chapel, I started reading the King James Bible, which is Old English, so it's very difficult to read, but it greatly increased my reading comprehension. Since I read that, I moved from that to just a bunch of other literature. I guess for some reason, I got addicted to literature. Probably for some of the same... Not not a bad addiction to have. Yeah, uh, there are definitely worse uh, addictions. Yeah, I just have a genuine love for the written word. I feel that 
something that the written word does is that it helps to, it can, can take a confused mental state and help to order it. It can help to regulate it. And there, in the accumulation of collective wisdom, there's safety there. There's uh, guidance there. There's comfort there. And I found all of those things in, in literature. I feel sad for people that don't have the capacity to read because they were never taught because of the geography in which they grew up or the environment in which they grew up. I think it's a real loss if uh, people don't have the, the resources that they need to be able to read. And, and I have to say that from our conversations, I know that when you talk of the literature that inspires you and has given you guidance and reflection, this is not lightweight stuff. I mean, you're not reading romance novels. You're reading serious and, in many cases, very challenging works, philosophical works, uh, political science works, presumably literary fiction from across the ages. Yeah, I, uh, I think it, I, it really, I feel like my, both my moral life and my intellectual life really began with the works of Plato and with Socrates. Because Socrates lays down a very profound morality that if you treat others unkindly or you try to manipulate them, that ultimately what occurs is that you end up doing damage to yourself. This registered with me quite a bit. So it began really with Plato's works, and then it branched out to everything uh, from Nietzsche to Hegel. But I would say, I feel like my reading did reach a climax at some point. And that's a, maybe a strange way to articulate uh, reading. But the reason I feel this is because in critical theory, the critical theory of the Frankfurt School, which has Adorno, Horkheimer, Eric Fromm, uh, Herbert Marcuse, that people don't understand about these critical theorists. Not only were they great humanitarians who put forth philosophies of profound compassion and profound social responsibility, but on top of that, these are thinkers who had a mastery not only of philosophy and psychology and sociology, but also aesthetics. So they're, they're very broadly read. I feel like there, uh, some kind of level was achieved when I started reading them. I felt like their philosophy was just directed much more toward humanity. Uh, like a very strong humanistic philosophy. And, and I understand that Walter Benjamin is um, another influence that, that, you've, uh, that you've drawn upon. Yeah, most certainly. Um, his story, I think, is quite sad. Um, I guess there's controversy surrounding his death. There, I saw recently some research where they tried to argue that he didn't commit suicide. But in his case, it's warranted no matter what, considering what he was facing. And it's very sad when social conditions reach the point where human life is forced to negate itself. And that was the situation that uh, he was faced with. Absolutely. Chased out of Germany, chased out of France on the verge of being apprehended by the Nazis. I want to return to a point that you raised, which is the loss to humanity when the creative potential of individuals is thwarted by the situations of their lives. And it can be poverty, it can be abuse, it can be lack of access, it can be being raised in a culture that doesn't value the artistic impulse and creativity. Um, I started recently, belatedly, I should have read it years ago, reading um, a book by David Graeber called Bullshit Jobs, in which he posits that a substantial proportion of the work that people do in this world is not only unnecessary, but in many cases socially destructive. They, they don't have enough distance to, to recognize it, or they do recognize it, but feel trapped in those jobs. Those people could be creators, and society could continue on 
just as effectively uh, without the work that they do because it's really not valuable work. It doesn't contribute to people being housed, fed, clothed, um, but they could be creating joy for themselves and for society, for others, if only that creativity were properly valued. Yeah, I think it's a very sad state that a vast majority of the world lives in abject poverty. It's inexcusable with the achievements in technology that we have. And I've never known a pianist who has made his own piano. Without a doubt, every artist, every intellectual, every scientist, every engineer is the result of a social process wherein they receive some kind of help from someone so that they could fulfill their potentials. And if this social help is thwarted or made unavailable, then people cannot fulfill their potential. And I'm guessing that there's millions upon millions of people who experience this and who know this intuitively because they know they have a contribution to make they know they have a gift to give, but they can't give it because they lack the resources necessary. And I feel for them because I've been in that situation so many times. Even now, as an artist, my greatest fear is that my circumstances will render me unable to bring my craft to a higher fruition. It's, it is a scary thought. My concern is not with fame in any way, shape or form. I don't care about this, but I care very much about producing a quality product, a product that when an individual gives themselves to it, when they pay attention to it, when they bring their sorrow to it, it doesn't let them down. This is how I feel when I listen to Mahler or Beethoven, there's substance there. There's what you give to the music, it gives back to you. And that requires a very, I would imagine, you tell me if I'm wrong, a very deeply introspective process on your part to find an analogy in melody and harmony to your experience, to your deepest impulses, and translate that into a, a sonic form that has the stamp of authenticity, that it really, in a way, directly reflects what you're experiencing at the, at the deepest level of your, yourself, your soul, however you want to express it. And that must be a very rigorous and a very intensive experience. In all of my music, none of my music is about technique or theory. All of my music is about psychological and philosophical content. In every piece of music that I compose, I'm trying to achieve the same thing. And what, what this thing is, I call it transference. And by transference, I mean bringing my emotional and transferring my emotional and mental state into the language of music. So my first consideration when composing a piece of music is never technique. And in fact, when I hear pieces of music like this, I don't like them. I'm turned off by them. It's why I like the music of Mahler so much and Shostakovich and Beethoven, because I believe that at the best moments, it's not technique that they exemplify, but they exemplify this act of transference, this attempt to take your mental state and project it into a musical language. And so in all of my music, that's, that's what I try to achieve is a transparency of expression as opposed to a intelligent consideration of form. Right. And, and I would say that because of the, the deeply personal nature 
of your music, in a way, it renders you somewhat immune from the considerations of a larger zeitgeist, if you will. The fact is that, you know, we live in a world in which sophistication of a, you know, highly schooled palate becomes a mark of accomplishment. And, you know, the ability to, in a way, sneer at the work of others in such a way as to demonstrate one's own mastery, knowledge, um, expertise, becomes a barrier bet uh, between those who prognosticate about the arts and the actual direct experience, the state of wonder, of being transported, that is the essence of the arts. I've often felt that, you know, I pity the poor critics because in their need to show their eloquence and their um, refined palates, they've lost the ability to taste. And uh, one of the things that is very evident in your music is its, um, its absolute sincerity and its unabashed expression of the emotional state that you were experiencing at the time that you wrote it. So in many ways, it's irrelevant what those adjudicators of taste say. It's really a matter of your communicating to people who are receptive to your message.
I remember a uh, quote by Frederick Nietzsche at the beginning of one of his books. He said that the problem with his readers is that they read his writings too casually. And I thought a lot about this because a writer needs careful readers and a composer needs careful listeners. And I don't feel that we are moving into a state and culture where careful listening is something that is taught or celebrated. I feel that everything is moving at a faster and faster pace and shorter and shorter sound bites. And so if there's a piece of artwork that requires a longer attention span, I feel that that piece of artwork is already set at a disadvantage because it's being injected into an atmosphere that is hostile to what, what is required to understand a piece of artwork like that. And I find um, one of the most discouraging things, I think, is if I compose a piece of music that I feel has stated something that is psychologically significant or maybe works through some type of philosophical angst or expresses some type of suffering, I, I feel discouraged when I send that piece of music to people and they just give it a casual listening. It's very hard to gauge one's own work even after a while. That's why I take uh, eight day breaks. My ear pretty much gets exhausted from the tones. Well, there was a Roman philosopher who wrote a treatise on aesthetics and it was in the form of a letter to a young poet. And his advice to the young poet uh, was, after you write it, put it in a drawer for seven years and then read it again. So I understand that need for a little bit of time for reflection. And let's face it, we we live in a hyper-stimulated world in which um, information and, you know, I will use the, the air quote symbol, content, is thrown at us in such rapid succession that the capacity for reflection is at risk of being obliterated. And I think that, um, first of all, this isn't good for our inner state because, you know, we need peace and we need time to reflect. You know, it's one reason why getting into nature can be so valuable and so restorative. Turning off your device for an hour or two and, um, Telling yourself that it'll be all right once the uh, the um, the I, the electronic IV drip into your arm is disconnected is perhaps useful. It is a, a challenging problem. It's often commented on, especially by you know graying folks like me, that you know attention span is actually a valuable thing to have, and the ability to read a work that is five hundred or even a thousand pages and stick with it from start to finish can be a re- rewarding journey. It's very hard in this cultural moment and environment to do that. But I think that it also robs people of the critical faculty to, to question the barrage of information that's thrown at them to do anything other than accept it because there's more coming so quickly that you really don't have a chance to ask questions about what, what's been fed into your eyes or your ears. And another thing I think that's sad is that this is not It's not the fault of people that the education systems through which they pass and the culture through which they pass fosters this in all of us in one degree or another. It's, it, it comes with passing through society with living in society. And in many cases, it comes from individuals being deprived of quality education. We live in a time in which the predominant spirit of the age, at least in much of the world, is market valuation of everything. And, you know, one cynic that I know once said, sir, humanity has no cash value. That may really shock me when I heard it, but I thought, well, we teach kids to code and we are obsessed with 
stem with the idea that it's, you know, the ultimate goal for a child's development is to prepare them to enter the workforce. What about the, the value of their lives? That is to say, to live a rich and, and possibly a life that it, in which cons consumption is not the, the only value. I think one of the main things that allowed me to connect with classical music, it sounds very foreign to a young person when they first hear it, but what allowed me to connect with it was understanding the tragic lives of many of the great composers. Beethoven going deaf, Mahler losing over a dozen brothers and sisters from the time he was growing up, so he's haunted by death. And I remember how strange Mahler's music sounded to me when I first heard it. I could in no way relate to it until I read about his life story. And when I read about his life story, I realized that this is a person who, without a doubt, has suffered a lot of loss. And because of that, has a lot of sorrow. And I remember after I had read his life story, I listened to the final movement to his third symphony, which is just a truly heartbreaking uh, adagio. And for the first time ever, I I felt like I could understand what he was saying. And it happened when I brought my own struggles, my own sorrow to the music and allowed the music to connect with my sorrow. I think because I learned about classical music this way, I think my own music is, is the same way. I think that if a person brings their sorrow to my music, I think that is when a person will be able to make a connection with it or to understand it. Yeah, there is a, a melancholy and an elegiac quality about much of your music. But, you know, I, I have to say as well that in the course of their works, you know, Mahler and works like, for example, the finale of the Resurrection Symphony, the Second Symphony, 
Beethoven in, you know, many, many of his works, they work their way through to reconciliation and um, a sense of joy. You know, Mahler in the Fourth Symphony, you know, finds that joy in the simplicity of an idealized version of childhood and in folk culture. Uh, so there are many paths to it. And, and I hope that, that over time, that's something that you will experience and that it will, that, that working through will be reflected in, in how you express your, your music. I feel that I will have achieved something significant if other, another human being like myself, like a, a young person or any person goes through a loss, experience some type of tragedy, and they can come to a piece of my work and they can hear it the same way that I heard Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, our Mahler symphonies. And it, it just, it makes them feel like they're not alone in their suffering. I, I feel that that is an achievement. To me, fame is not an achievement. Wealth is not an achievement. But making that human connection through art, to me, that is what art is all about. And I have to say that um, one of the things that I've noticed, um, which could be both a, a clue to what you were experiencing at the time of composition or just a, a pathway in, is the, the very interesting and evocative titles that you choose for your pieces, like Impressions of Starlight, From the Age of Goethe, Archromic uh, Cryptogram, Love's Remembrance, um, Mahler's Night Shadows, and uh, one piece that's for harpsichord, actually, the Bodenbach Prelude, which actually surprised me quite a bit. What sort of process goes into the, the choice of titles for your pieces? Well, um, it's a good question. I very seldom set out to compose a piece with a title in advance, but sometimes this does happen. Sometimes I have the, the idea of what I want to achieve in my mind, but a lot of the times it, it, the title happens after the fact, after I've composed the piece and the titles to me, they're, they're part of the creative process as well. They, they reflect in one sense, what the music means to me, what images the music provokes in me. So it's not a, it's not a, a set process. It's just sometimes it happens before and sometimes it happens after. It is very evocative. And it, it I think, goes to, uh, in some cases, the depth of your reading and your literary experience. The um, kinds of references can act as an, an interesting trigger to our own associations. I have to say I congratulate you on the, the courage and persistence that you've shown in continuing to work. And I do want to make it clear because, you know, what people are seeing is, you know, you've been thoughtful enough to dress very nicely for this, uh, this, uh, this podcast <laughs> for the camera. You're surrounded by lovely books. There's a, um, a little, um, reproduction of, uh, Rodin's The Thinker, uh, above your head, which I think, um, pays tribute to the importance of thought and reflection, but you're not in a, markedly more comfortable circumstance now. I mean, it's not as though, you know, music has brought you fortune and, and, you know, it's all easy and clear sailing. Am I, am I right about that? Yeah, that's correct. No, I, um, my existence, it hangs by a thread. That's not over dramatizing the situation. I will never be homeless again in my life because of how brutal the process of homelessness is. If I am ever faced with homelessness again, it's just not something that I will endure. So there's still a tremendous amount of anxiety involved in what I'm doing. My future is absolutely uncertain. The instrument that I use to compose music on is uncertain. So none of it is certain. And yeah, it's a precarious, uh, process, an insecure process. I certainly can relate to the challenges uh, because um, time and again, I've seen artists whose work has been worthy and deserve to be encouraged, um, who just haven't found 
a generous helper. We have processes, their social processes, their bureaucratic process for assessing which art deserves to be supported. You know, it doesn't, they're too insensitive to make allowances for the, the breadth of experience and individuality or the fact that, you know, things like grant applications or applications to foundations, this is not within the skills and capability of many people who are capable of enriching the world through their own creativity. Um, and I think that, you know, we all collectively need to find, whether it's people who are prepared in big and small ways to be patrons, or just to show up and listen and be an audience and, you know, provide feedback. We, we need that for artists like you, uh, for really anyone who shows promise. And, um, and I think that, as in so many other ways in society, we're failing. We're not meeting the need. And it's a need that could beautify the world. The world doesn't have to be as grim and often ugly and brutal as it is. You know, we do have space for not only smelling the roses, but planting them. And uh, so I guess this is, on my part, a call for us to find a way to do better. And I, I hope that if some of our listeners are touched by your music, the selections of which we've been playing, or they want to hear more and go to your YouTube site and, and listen to it, um, that they will, will be inclined to, to find a way to help, whether it's you directly or others that they may encounter. Uh, because uh, I think the, the world needs this gift, and we don't value it enough because I dare say, you know, I made the, the cynical reference to uh, a friend of mine uh, and his comment that humanity has no cash value. No, cash value is not real value. Humanity is real value. And that's where the arts come from. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, Nietzsche made the comment that, I think it was Nietzsche, that we want our poets to suffer because then they infuse that experience into their work. If anyone wants to face adversity, just live in poverty. I mean, that's, there's enough adversity in poverty for multiple lifetimes. Right. I, I don't want to get into contentious issues, but I think that poverty is a constructed state that is completely unnecessary. There are ways out of it, you know. I mean, it may shock people to know that Richard Nixon, Richard Nixon, I'll say that again the third time, Richard Nixon planned on ending poverty in America by implementing a universal basic income. It was ultimately held up, but it almost passed Congress. And uh, he basically wanted to be the president who ended poverty in the United States in his lifetime. Didn't succeed. And uh, things have not gotten markedly better since then. And, you know, the answer in many cases has been to um, criminalize the poor, to marginalize the poor, to let the poor be faced with addictions or incarceration. You know, in other words, instead of meeting that, that challenge, that, that human challenge with compassion and a positive approach to finding a solution, we basically do it by taking the dehumanizing effects of poverty and amplifying them, multiplying them exponentially. I have to believe that we can do better. Maybe we should start by getting people to listen to your music and getting back in touch with their own compassion. You know, I think one of the great um, struggles of art itself, and the Frankfurt School touches on this, is that if a human being is expressing their experience and their experience is formulated through some kind of oppressive system, then it stands to reason that the, what they will be replicating in their art is the experience of oppression. And it, it really is a challenge to be able to produce an art that can actually transcend a class oppression, an actual liberated art. I think that would ultimately be the goal, but for that to be the goal, social circumstances have to drastically alter in human beings because all we can really express at the end of the day is either an intellectual formation of theory or we can try to share our experience. 
And that's not to say that there's no value in a shared experience of oppression. It, it made me feel that I was not alone, gave me hope, gave me some type of transcendence. But of course, the ideal of any advanced species or advanced society would ultimately be to achieve a form of art that does not merely replicate a class oppression, a form of art that can actually express a liberation and psychological freedom. Uh, absolutely. And I, I did want to get your reflections on the fact that, um, you know, what we call classical music, which is obviously the product of about a thousand year tradition um, coming out of Western Europe, but now actually drawing upon the cultures and expressions of national experiences and cultural experiences really from all over the world. But that is one path. And there are other paths through other artistic and musical traditions, other traditions of thought. And in fact, in Western thought, we have often seen an openness to um, non-Western thought. For example, Schopenhauer, who was perhaps the most influential 19th century thinker on the subject of art and aesthetics, his view of transcendence was drawn almost entirely from Eastern religions. The idea of um, letting go of the self in order to experience a a direct taste of the infinite of the you know the reality of universal uh, principles and forces this is very much drawn from south asian traditions for example um and what he called tearing away of the veil of maya so you know i certainly believe that there are many paths to reach that that goal and that we can actually be enriched by experiencing more of them and breaking down the barriers between those different traditions if we do so with open hearts and minds. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's a, an important point too. Um, it seems to me that the most valuable commodity in society is compassion and empathy. I would much rather have a person that has compassion than a person who just has a rigid form of reason. And compassion and empathy, I mean, they ultimately function to eradicate and lessen human suffering because we reach out to each other through those capacities and comfort each other and help each other. You know, I, I hope to cultivate this as much as I can in my own life.
I think that the compassion and empathy that is expressed in your music is a, a wonderful move in that direction. And I think that, you know, in some ways, compassion, and it's one reason why certain faith traditions are so radical in a way, because they reflect, and compassion itself as a, an impulse reflects a tremendously unpopular, in the sense that it, it is so rarely practiced, um, concept, which is that the other is an equal to yourself. That's how you feel what they're feeling, is to recognize their, their shared humanity with your own. And it is a tremendous leveling force. One of the most amazing things that I've come across in my reading is, was in psychology, and it is the, the concept of mentalization. And this concept of mentalization is put forward by a psychologist named Peter Fonagy. And what mentalization is trying to achieve in human beings is trying to achieve an awareness of our own mental state. And in addition to that, an awareness of the mental state of others. And by trying to implement this within the family structure, within the lives of individuals, I believe that psychology has found a way to heal a great deal of the social pathologies that we face, because I think this pathology stems, as these psychologists do, from a psychological inability to engage in a mentalization process, which is an awareness of, of my mental state and then an awareness of the mental state of my fellow human being. When I'm capable of doing that, I can automatically treat people with greater dignity. I can approach them with kindness. I can reflect on whether or not my actions are causing them some type of harm. I've been just so amazed um, by the progress that psychology has made in this direction. And I feel that it is such a great beacon of light uh, brought into the world because it, it promises healing to millions and millions of people and to society in general. If society will do what is necessary to make access to that, um, that care and those insights available to many. I think that's a really vital, important point. Um, that same psychologist, Peter Fonagy, had mentioned in one of the talks he did that there was a, a, a place in Mexico, I don't know exactly where, they had decided to invest in mental health. And when they did this, they found out that their prison population dropped. In, in a 10-year time frame, it went down. Because people that end up in prison, they have severe psychological disturbances a lot of the time that are no fault of their own. And they've never had any intervention or mediation to help them work through these emotional disturbances. So it's really a beautiful thing, I think, um, that psychology is now trying to figure out clever ways to mediate in society or to interject itself to help people and to correct their lives and to give them some type of stability and hope. Right. You know, I think that contrasts rather starkly with, you know, the more common approach in society, which is, I, I liken it to beating a crying child for the grave offense of being unhappy and thinking that with enough beatings, the unhappiness will go away. That's how we, we deal with pain and suffering to a very large degree. And it is not only irrational and destructive, but, you know, it's as though you're trying to create an unhappiness generator to uh, expand the amount of misery exponentially. That doesn't really work. It doesn't work for me. I don't understand why we keep repeating the same patterns over and over again, except that we, we need, on a larger scale, to have uh, an expanded sense of awareness and an openness to the idea that what we've always done may not be the best thing to do. But being trapped in habitual patterns is, is, alas, a common feature in, in society. And it, it causes a, you know, a social pathology that makes society more violent. 
harder to live in. It pits people against each other. You know, I think the main thing that my existence has taught me at this point in my life is that there is no such thing as quality without a social process that every artist is the result of this. Every doctor is the result of this. Every healthy human being is the result of this. And where this goes wrong or where the experience of the individual is not a qualitative social experience, but the individual is abused and mistreated, there you have, you know, a cycle that begins to get passed on from, from generation to generation. And uh, breaking that cycle is a very difficult thing. And I think our, we're just now becoming conscious of it through psychology studies. In a very indirect way, you remind me of um, a very simple, but sometimes simple statements are, are deeply important and profound a uh, statement that occurred in one of Glenn Gould's radio documentaries, his portrait of Stokowski. And this was made at the height of the, the Vietnam War, and Stokowski was a very vigorous opponent of the war and of war in general, and he had studied Eastern religions, and he had, you know, delved deeply into, you know, many schools of thought. And um, he was asked to imagine our world as seen from the eyes of aliens, from millions and millions of light years away, and what would they think of us? And he basically said, I had the impression that there are, that our intelligence on this planet is one of many throughout the universes, the universe, and that many of those intelligence are greater and more profound than our own. And if they saw our planet riven with war, they would understand that the process of making war requires intelligence. It requires strategy and machines and tactics and thought and planning. But ultimately, that intelligence is the lowest form of human intelligence and should always be understood to be exactly that, the devotion of a vital human capacity to something whose only pro uh, purpose is destruction. It seems to me that we have that low form of human intelligence and we need to break it. What a great point. I, I agree with that completely. It's misplaced and placed and wasted energy, we could be doing so much more. We're no longer at the point in our psychological development of our understanding of human development. We're no longer at the point where we're merely guessing, but we understand what goes into the developmental process of a healthy human being. We finally understand that because of the work of Bowlby and so many other people who have looked into attachment theory. So we, we could make better human beings, but it's like what you brought up that in order to do this, we have to have our social priorities straight and not be spending money to manufacture bombs to blow each other up, but to fund the basic necessities of life so that our fellow humans don't suffer. There are 
many reasons why those inequities persist. I mean, economists like Thomas Piketty has talked about them. And, you know, at the fundamental level, I think that many people who make key decisions in society are trapped by the idea that somehow, if they are not on top, then they are underneath. And that the sum total of the raison d'etre of society is, you know, for certain people to have more yachts and more properties and more expensive vehicles and, you know, more ownership. And uh, alas, there really are only so many things that you can own to good effect until it's really just a place counter to mark your position relative to other people. And, you know, ultimately, since we're doomed to all end up in the same place, that position of relative stature is an illusion too. Because we start in the same place and we end in the same place. And uh, nothing that happens in between is going to change that. But we can hopefully uh, learn to make a higher quality life for ourselves and what we're doing now. Uh, I think that's the worst part about so much human suffering is that it truly is unnecessary. But as you pointed out, really, thought tends to be applied to destructive things. And uh, even for those who think they're benefiting from it, there's the, um, the old Roman saying, uh, qui bono, who benefits? And the answer ultimately is no one, because going back to your point about Plato, the person who profits in one sense from the harm inflicted on others is actually destroying their own soul. But on that heavy note, I actually do have to sort of take a little bit of a turn because, as our name suggests, we are the Glenn Gould Foundation, and you <laughs> wrote a piece dedicated by, and I presume inspired by, Glenn Gould. Tell me a little bit about what he and his music and his ideas um, have meant to you and, um, and the value that you see in them. Well, I encountered Gould when I was living in that chapel. I was very struck by the personal nature of the way he would uh, take a piece of music and he would play it as though it was his own. And I think this is what a lot of great pianists really end up doing uh, with music. And obviously not just me, it's millions and millions of people across the world that his playing makes contact with them like this. And I guess that's what it, it was for me. One of the things I found interesting is that in one particular video, Gould is talking about this Bach music being something that is purely intellectual. I didn't have a, didn't experience that way. I experienced it when Gould played it as something that was very emotional. I wish I could ask him about that, but that's not possible. So I think he just, his sense of timing, his touch, I felt like it helped to expand my own capacity my own act of expression in music. And I, I do have to say that, you know, having read a great deal of his writings, I have one of those memories that latches on to odd details. I know that he, in talking about Bach, he was 
definitely impressed by the complexity and the intellectual grasp and the addition of numerology in the development of his structures. And that is a, a towering feat of mind. To write a four or a five part contrapuntal piece is no small feat. But in another interview, and this is a phrase that I repeated it many times that stuck with me forever, you know, he recorded two or three Scarlatti sonatas. Scarlatti, of course, is contemporary with Bach. His music is attractive and virtuosic and showy and actually very beautiful, but at many levels much simpler than Bach. And uh, he was asked by the interviewer, why have you not recorded more Scarlatti? Your playing is absolutely wonderful. And he said, well, what's the point? There's more spiritual nourishment in the first three bars of the prelude in C from uh, the well-tempered clavier than all 500 Scarlatti sonatas. And that really struck me as a very significant way into understanding what motivated him in the world, word spiritual nourishment. So I, I don't think you, you need to worry too much about the, the depth of emotional engagement. And it certainly comes through in his playing, I think. One of the things I find interesting about Bach's music versus Rachmaninoff or Chopin is that the timing, Bach's tempo is so exact to play in a fugue form. It's so exact. If you miss just one split second of the tempo, the piece is destroyed. Whereas there's more room in a Rachmaninoff piece or a Chopin piece. The tempo is, it's not so rigid. And uh, if I ever play in more of a fugue or contrapuntal style, um, if I ever compose in that style, I find it much more difficult precisely because you can't make any mistakes in the process. It's true. I mean, it's, it's a very unforgiving form. And although it's not so much because of structure, more because I think of transparency, a lot of artists have said that about Mozart as well. You can hear everything because it's so crystal clear in all of its textures. But in Bach's case, it's because there are so many moving parts that are very precisely coordinated to fall at the same time, for harmonies to line up at the same time, for them to drive each other forward and so on. And if those those don't line up, then alas, the structure is kind of like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. You take away one brick at the base and, well, you don't have a Leaning Tower of Pisa anymore. You know, the, uh, I think it's the 15th Contrapunctus, and Gould mentioned that that was one of his favorite pieces that he thought that Bach could ever compose. It's the one that's unfinished. It's either the 14th or the 15th, I can't remember right now. When I heard that piece of music, it sounded normal to me, and it wasn't until years later that I realized that that music sounds very strange and abstract to people. It just sounded like normal from music to me, but you know, if I tried to play it for someone else, they'd say, this is really strange and bizarre. And I, I think Gould makes the connection between Bach and Schoenberg that they engage in a similar type of harmonic structure, a, a very advanced harmonic structure. And when I listen to Schoenberg, what I like in his music is this advanced harmony. It sounds very, very beautiful to my ear. What I don't like in Schoenberg is the, the technique um, that he tries to incorporate along with those harmonies. It seems far too esoteric to me or just based on trying to be a form of pure theory. And my ear is very much turned off from that. I can hear when a pianist or composer is just trying to be clever in theory. And because my experience of composing is so different from that. It's so directly linked up to my emotional life and my psychological life. It's just hard for me to connect to that kind of thing. It doesn't really do anything for me when I realize that, well, this, this composer is just trying to be clever. Well, you, you certainly are not alone. Even today, almost, in fact, about a hundred years after the codification of atonality into the tone row uh, concept, the dodecaphonic uh, approach to composition, there are still people who, you know, run and hide under the bed when Schoenberg's music comes on. But I, I do think that there's a lot to be said for that 
that period, that sort of period in between after, you know, his late, more post-romantic works like The Clare Nacht or Gurleader, you know, big Mahlerian works in which he said, you know, traditional tonality has reached its end point. It can't go any further. We've pulled it. We've, you know, made the the resolutions of dissonances stretch out almost to infinity. We just have to sort of move into into something new. And that new was a kind of a a deeply expressive but very unsettled no man's land from the period just before the, the First World War up until the, the 20s. And I think that the, the disorientation of not having a structural concept to organize this freedom around ultimately proved, you know, a bit of a dead end to him as well. And obviously he his approach was both artistic and expressive, but also intellectual. So, you know, there's a kind of arbitrariness about the idea that you have to repeat every note in the scale before you re- return to another. I think ultimately did prove it did. And I mean, he certainly gave it a good, a good go. But he also later in life said, nothing that I've done denies the fact that there's still plenty of great music to be written in C major. So he, he wasn't, wasn't an ab- absolutist. He didn't say my way is the only way. Something that um, if I compose in, a, in modern harmony, in a contemporary harmonic structure, I don't, to, to my ear, this is not an exercise in abstraction or theory, but what it is, is those harmonic structures allow for an expansion of expression. So, and I don't hear that in a lot of atonal music, but I, I hear it that now the, the range of emotional expression can be added to, and we can express more complicated or sophisticated psychological states through this these advanced harmonies. And that's what I try to do if I utilize advanced harmonic structures. As I mentioned, I'm always trying to achieve this state of transference. Sometimes I achieve it, and other times it just simply eludes me. Well, the the end result in any artistic pursuit is, is never a foregone conclusion. And of course, not every work by Bach or Beethoven is a masterpiece. Believe me, you know, I could, I've gone through and recorded almost all of Bach's organ music. And of course, the great towering masterpieces like the Passacaglia Fugue or, you know, various of the major preludes and fugues, you know, stand out. But believe me, there are lots of choral preludes which you can listen to and forget almost immediately. So the <laughs> the foregone conclusion doesn't exist, but the endeavor and the search for it certainly is is a vital part of the exercise. And I do want to want to say that one of the things that is very interesting about our time, you know, and by our time I mean about the last hundred years, is the opening up of music in what we call the classical tradition, which really has expanded so much and in so many different directions that it's almost a meaningless term now to encompass an enormous variety of um, approaches to harmony, to structure, to rhythm, to the incorporation of many uh, multicultural elements, including melody, orchestration, and so on. That, you know, it's a time of enormous liberation. And on one hand, we have, you know, as you call the more intellectually abstract schools, but then you have everything in between from people like Aaron Copland to, um, to various English composers who are more quote unquote conservative to, you know, the great Russians like Shostakovich and Prokofiev and Stravinsky, who basically moved through about five different stylistic phases over the course of his career to the minimalists, to electronic music. I mean, we are in, in a sense, a golden age of diversity in terms of the, the range. And it's an incredibly rich and an open menu for people to explore and discover. And ultimately, you know, there is no one path to nirvana. Um, but I think for anyone who approaches it with an open heart and mind, there's probably a path out there somewhere waiting for you. I think the 
the conditions of society, the way that it's kind of unfolding and becoming more abstract and avant-garde in its function has opened up the door to a lot of the, the late 20th century music, um, that people didn't really understand, but if, if they return to it now, and I'm talking about composers like Walter Piston, William Schumann, if, if you listen to their work, are their symphonies, now it makes so much more sense. Um, just like a lot, some of the work of Alvin Berg. And I think the reason it makes more sense is because society is coming to reflect the expressions and the harmonic sounds that these composers embodied. Our experience, unfortunately, is beginning to line with the emotions that are contained in these pieces of work. And I think there may in fact end up being a resurgence of a lot of this music that in the next 10 to 20 years, I think it might end up coming into its own a lot more. I think you're right because, you know, at least the, the music as it appeared, let's say by the twenties through the thirties was deeply, deeply impacted by the, the global trauma of the first world war. And that shattered beliefs. And, you know, the so-called eternal verities were not so eternal. Um, so, so many assumptions about culture and society were unhooked from their moorings. And it created a period of profound uncertainty and dislocation. And I think in many ways, we're going through something like that now. I mean, if you look at climate change, it's an existential threat. But the idea that a world could be coming to an end, that very much was the the mood and spirit that led up to and followed the, the First World War. So it's the old saying, history doesn't, um, doesn't uh, repeat itself, but it rhymes. And we may be going through a bit of rhyming right now. Yeah, I know I find a lot more clarity and um, something interesting I find in these, these advanced uh, harmonic tonal structures, I actually find tonal relief in them, which means if if a person is hearing music that just follows a traditional key structure and traditional resolution and uh, it, it gets old, it gets repetitious to the ear over time. And what's interesting is harmonies like Schoenberg's and Walter Piston and William Schumann, these, they feel like they give you a relief from the repetition of these traditional classical structures, at least for me, that's what it feels like. It's almost like it's refreshing or recharging my ear. I agree. And I think it's been that way for many people. And, and whether they find that in those particular composers or in different schools, you know, coming from a slightly different um, lineage, I do think that the ability to experience that kind of break with the past can be enormously refreshing. It can be a break from a sense of the cliche or the, the overused, but it also can allow us to return to older works written in those traditional harmonic languages with a refreshed ear and a deeper sense of appreciation because we've experienced something so totally different. Yeah, I want to uh, say something about young people and young artists that know they have something to contribute, but do not have the resources or conditions to be able to bring their, their craft to fruition. I, I think that this is, this is just one of the most difficult mental things for a person to deal with because it, it makes existence in one sense feel futile. Like, uh, you're wasting away, your potential is being lost. And I, I guess I just want to say that I have a uh, solidarity and a great sense of empathy and compassion for artists who are in that situation, because I just understand it so well. And, you know, I would just try to encourage them to continue to do what they can uh, to perfect 
their craft and continue, continue educating themselves as much as they can. There is never a guarantee, of course, but part of the act of creating, it's part of the quality of existence. If I knew the world was going to end next week, I would still continue composing because it's, it's part of my own mental process, part of my own existential coping. And I think that's the most important place for artistic expression to be is at the place where the artist is not doing it to achieve some type of social status, but is doing it as an authentic expression of their own existence and almost as a form of therapy. Well, that is a perfect and a, a very profound place for us to end our conversation. I, I really want to encourage people. We've uh, played a few examples over the course of this conversation, but please um, explore Edie's music. Uh, we'll post a link to his uh, YouTube channel in the, the, uh, the notes to this podcast. And uh, if you can find a way to support an artist, to help a young person to have the, the encouragement, just the emotional encouragement to explore and create the little opportunities that they need to do it, and the assurance that whatever else they do in life, that act of creation is valuable. You will have done something. I really want to wish you luck. And um, to, uh, to end the podcast, is there one piece of yours that you'd particularly like us to end with? That's a good question. You know, there's so many, I, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Maybe decor, which means from the heart, just because I think many people have appreciated that piece of music. But I would certainly like to thank you, Brian. My experience with you as a person is one of absolute integrity, kindness, and compassion. And I would like to thank you for taking the time to listen to my music and taking the time to have this conversation with me. It matters. You know, it makes me feel that I'm not so isolated. Um, it makes me feel that, uh, you know, that I, I, I do have something to say, um, that I do have value. And I'm not the only person who needs this. Lots of people need this uh, throughout the world. And that is just to know that they have value, they have worth. And uh, that's how you've made me feel. And you've shown compassion to me. And I just, I want to thank you for it. I, I can honestly say, first of all, thank you for that. That's very kind. But I feel like the gift has been completely reciprocal. And I certainly feel enriched from our friendship, from the ideas we've had a chance to, to bat around. And uh, I hope that our listeners will, will join in, in um, exploring your music and, uh, and finding a place in their hearts for it. And I just want to thank you again for, for being with us this evening. Thank you. The Glenn Gould Foundation is a registered Canadian charity and we rely on the support of arts lovers like you to continue bringing inspiring stories to life. Please consider giving by visiting our website, glenngould.ca. And if you're interested in keeping up with the Gould Standard podcast and more work from the Foundation, be sure to follow us across social media on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at the Glenn Gould Foundation.